or still waking up yet? DJ Lam, where are you based? North America, I'm guessing. Um, sorry, I'll just unmute myself. Uh, so uh, I'm near Toronto, Canada. Yeah. Okay, and what time is it? Uh, just 7 a.m. So oh, I'm, well, I'm lucky that I'm on the on the east side. I, I would I don't think I would be here if I was um, in Seattle, where it's 4 a.m. right now. Oh wow! Well, yeah. See, this is why we try and record the session. So yeah, yeah, make it accessible for people in Seattle and in Myanmar at the same time. Um. Um. Uh, what I will do is. Um, Kiara, if it's okay, I'll start just introducing the community engagement forum while people are still trickling in um, before handing it over to you. So um, the, this session is organized by the community engagement forum, often referred to especially by me as the CE forum. Um, and uh, we're um, an online interagency community of practice on engaging communities in displacement responses. Um, we are part of the CCCM cluster globally, but we're open to um, practitioners from any sector or cluster um, who are working on engaging um, communities in displacement responses or want to learn more about it. Um, what we do is we share resources and discuss challenges and solutions um, on how to engage in communities. Um, we do this on our web portal, so um, on this groups.io website and um, also on our LinkedIn and Instagram um, platforms. And we organize events um, such as these monthly community uh, coffee and chats um, and sometimes in person as well. Um, uh, on um, you know, relevant topics that are proposed by, proposed by the community members, so the community of practice community members. Um, and before I introduce today's session, I just want to um, introduce something else. Uh, our uh, new digital communications consultant, uh, Noor Arab, who has joined us and will help us in shaping our communication strategy and um, um, advice on as well as develop um, our products and um, the way we communicate amongst ourselves and externally. Um, do you want to introduce yourself there, Noor? Hello again, everyone. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of your time. I guess Kristen already said everything. Uh, my name is Noor and I'm uh, from Lebanon. Uh, I've been uh, uh, like working on CCM and communication since 2014, I guess. Is this when we met, Kristen? 13, I think. 13, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. Please get in touch. I will also uh, put my email uh, address on the chat uh, box uh, in case you'd like to, um, yeah, uh, talk to me. Uh, I'll be working uh, two days a week, mostly uh, on Mondays and Fridays. I think you might get in touch. Um as well soon with a survey on oh, yeah. communication priorities from the members. So watch this space. Thank you very much. Thanks, Noor. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to um, introduce the topic of today, which is community consultation in program design, which is something that we probably talk about a lot and aspire to a lot, but I haven't seen actually happening uh, very often. Um, and I think it's because of many reasons, like lack of resources, like staffing and time and and uh, dedicated funds. Um, so we may think that we're doing it because we we are planning to do it, but there are very few case studies of it actually being done. But we do have one here um, today from Mercy Corps Lebanon. So I'm going to hand over to you, Kiara, to share this with us. Thank you very much, Christine. Hi, everyone. It's great uh, to see you all online. Um, I'm really grateful for to Christine for offering the opportunity to share our lessons learned with you today. Um, so my name is Chiara Genovese. I work as cash advisor at Mercy Corps Lebanon. 
Um, at Mercy, Mercy Corps Lebanon implements a multipurpose cash program to help poor Lebanese families meet their food and non-food needs. And um, the program, the current programs is ending and the, the last cash transfer went out in February. We have identified a new funding opportunity with the ECHO, with the 2024 ECHO HIP. So um, as part of the process of uh, drafting the proposal, we wanted to um, include the communities and sort of engage with them to give them a chance to participate to the design of the project. Um, so when it comes to multipurpose cash assistance, important decisions regarding the design of, uh, of the program are made at the beginning, are made at the proposal stage. And this can be difficult to reverse later. Um, so between September 2023 and February 2024, Mercy Corps conducted uh, a consultation loop with Lebanese communities in the Bekaa Valley. Um, Yeah, so as part of this exercise, we consulted communities about their preferences for selection criteria um, outreach and registration channels, as well as uh, selection of the financial service provider. Um, we are very conscious that um, at project proposal stage, funding is not confirmed. So consulting populations at this stage of the project cycle may be very challenging in terms of raising the expectations of population regarding upcoming uh, assistance. We, participation is only meaningful when it is sustained. So at Mercy Corps, we conducted a, a sort of a sustained consultation loop, which means that we first consulted them between September and October about their preferences. And then we went back to them to close that information loop in February 2024. And so that's uh, at that point, we told them what we did with the information we collected from them, how we used it to design the multipurpose cash program. However, um, um, I guess um, sort of the risk of raising expectations can be exacerbated if uh, if, if engagement is sustained. So we were we were acutely conscious of the risks of uh, consulting populations at this stage. And so we decided to document our lessons learned, what we learned from this experience, and we wanted to share it uh, with you to sort of use this forum as a sounding board, as a way to reflect through our lessons learned, whether there was anything that we could have done differently, etc. cetera. Um, I guess um, our, our first lesson learned is about the fact that um, participation is an antidote for raising expectation. What we mean by this is that um, um, as we progressed through the participation loop, so as we went back to the communities, uh, we realized that expectations for assistance were real. Participants were definitely nurturing expectations for assistance. No matter how much we told them this is only a project proposal stage, we, funding is not confirmed, uh, participants still expected some form of uh, assistance from Mercy Corps. However, that, that sort of perception at the same time was mitigated by a sense of agency and the sense of participation that participants demonstrated during the loop. This sense of participation increased with, the, with sort of uh, the amount of communication they were receiving from Mercy Corps. Um, this means that ultimately uh, sustained uh, engagement helps to foster the agency of community members. They can, they have the, the, the information they need to think for themselves and sort of manage their own expectations. So this means that um, assistance is definitely important for vulnerable communities. However, being treated with respect is more important, especially at a time when assistance is not uh, coming. That's all the population, that's what, all what the crisis affected population ask for. Um, so this was, this is a sort of, we, 
we think of this as our proof of concept that participation is possible. Participation to program design is possible. However, we also encountered two sets of cautionary tales. And these are um, sort of what we wanted to share with you today. So um, I've got them in two slides. If you don't mind, I'll just put up my slides. Um, so cautionary tale number one is related to the fact that not all community preferences can be taken up. Um, I guess this is a way to sort of, um, it's a cautionary tale for aid providers to be realistic about what, about the extent to which communities can actually influence the design. There are a number of reasons why this cannot happen. In our experience, consultations sometimes were inconclusive, meaning that the participants' views were diverging. The example here is uh, we consulted, we asked participants to um, rank family profiles so as to identify the most vulnerable family profiles to prioritize for multiple purpose assistance. We um, listed um, categories such as female-headed households, elderly households, households with a member with a disability, etc. This exercise was inconclusive. There was no consensus among the participants. And this can be sort of explained by the fact that uh, vulnerable community members always have an incentive to indicate their own family category as the most vulnerable in order to maximize their chances to receive assistance. A second reason why um, community preferences cannot be taken up is um, the fact that they need to be triangulated with humanitarian principles. Um, the participants to the consultation expressed a desire to participate to the selection of uh, the participants to the multipurpose cash program. So they wanted to be involved in the targeting mechanism, in the targeting process. In a context like Lebanon, with deep religious and political factions, um, involving community members in the selection of program participants can run, runs the risk of exacerbating existing tensions. Um, and then um, consulting communities at the proposal phase of the project cycle may suffer from negative experience bias. What this means is that um, when talking to community members that are not currently assisted, uh, you run the risk of not of them not having any views. Um, the example here is uh, we asked participants about their preferences on the financial service provider. Which financial service provider would they prefer to use in case uh, they they were targeted with assistance? And um, some of the um, answers we got are the fact that some of them never use the financial service provider to be able to tell, to be able to express a preference. So sometimes all sort of all of this indicates that sometimes your program design cannot be uh, guided by the preferences of the population and pr program teams just need to make their own choices. Finally, um, community recommendations sometimes do not reflect the assistance modality for which funding is available. Here the example is um, a man, a male participant to the consultation expressed a desire for um, a livelihood uh, kind of intervention in the, in the form of um, a small grant for a grant for, for a small enterprise, for, for, for a small business. But this is not the type of funding opportunity, this did not align with the type of funding opportunity available to Mercy Corps. So again, this is an example of, um, of a time when um, community preferences simply cannot be taken up. The second set of um, sort of the cautionary tales that we documented is the fact that the notion of participation needs to adapt to local cultural norms. Um, the consultation loop sparked relevant discussions and internal dilemmas within the Mercy Corps team on the extent of information to share with affected communities. Some of the uh, staff members felt that going back over and over to the communities 
was um, increasing the risk of doing damage. Um, others felt more strongly about uh, maintaining communities uh, engaged and fully informed about the status of the proposal. Um, at the bottom of this slide, you see a quote from our, one of our main staff members. He said, transparency is not always good. These are European values and they are not applicable to our context. Um, the other observation is the fact that uh, the notion of participation and more generally um, a accountability to affected population is siloed within specialist functions. What this means is that sometimes program teams do not see it as their responsibility to um, sort of deliver um, AAP mechanisms or sort of they do not see it as their responsibility to um, strengthen the participation of communities into the in, in the program. Um, there is a need for teams to socialize more with the notion of uh, accountability to affect the population and, and participation. Finally, some very, very pragmatic consideration about the fact that um, we consulted four communities in September. Um, Two out of those four communities are likely to drop out of our program because uh, food security data um, shows an improvement in those communities. This is going to this is likely to be very negative news for these communities, especially among those that continue to nurture expectation for assistance after the consultations. In these cases, field staff is very reluctant to share negative news to members of the communities they live in. So there is a recognition here that our field staff often live very close to those um, affected communities that are consulted. And so they, they, they would feel very reluctant to share, to do any damage and share any negative news. Um, as a very final thought, I wanted to share with you the fact uh, a, a reflection that um, meaningfully engaged with affected population is resource intensive. As I mentioned, we went through the full loop of uh, consultation. We first collected um, insights about the community's preferences and then after submitting the proposal, we went back to those communities to share updates about the status of the proposal. This exercise required um, 15 days overall, 15 days full time of full time work for a team of 10 people, plus planning and preparation phases like, for example, drafting the tools, drafting the facilitation tools, etc. So it's just a cautionary tale about the fact that participation is all very good and sort of advocating for it is all very good, but we also need to be realistic about the amount of resources that this takes especially at the um, proposal stage of the project cycle when funding is not available yet. So I'll, I'll stop here um, and I'll see if you have any thoughts. Thanks so much, Kara. I, I really appreciate um, your very honest um, um, very honest notes um, about uh, this process and uh, I think it's an extremely healthy discussion to have around participation um, where it's not just all idolized but there's some realism in there. Um, I think Yaksan has uh, some comments. Well definitely I have a few comments and the great work you did and I really appreciate the dark side of community engagement, if we can call it, because it's not always uh, like, you know, colorful and as we try to do in our reports. But I think this quote is really, really, uh, it has like a strong quote about the community. I mean, transparency is always good, no matter where you're at or wherever community. And I think sometimes uh, communication is the key. I mean, the way we communicate the transparency and I'm sure the community, they try to push uh, to the max because of the survival mood they are in. And of course, 
they try to squeeze as much as they can because they know Mercy Corps is a big agency and they looking forward for more assistance. But again, I think transparency with the committee. I don't think, I don't believe any committee has, I mean, uh, I w let me rephrase this. I believe every community has the right to be part of uh, the transparency. It's not us as uh, NGOs or civil society to decide if they are up to the transparency or not. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you, Yaksan. These are very, very good thoughts. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have any immediate reaction. I guess uh, I shared uh, our insights from Mercy Corps on where on this topic, as I mentioned, it did generate uh, dilemmas. It did generate uh, internal dilemmas. Mm, but I would be I would be keen to hear from others. I would love to leave the floor and uh, hear more reactions. Craig, do you have a comment on this, or is it? A question for something else. Hi, yeah, it's on this topic. I couldn't help. I was listening in the background trying to look at emails to be honest, but I couldn't let that that one uh, move on. I'm Craig, I'm the global youth education and training specialist at, at the NRC. Um and yeah, I'm kind of split. So I just I think um I think the obviously the quote is probably taken out of a broader context as well. So I, I think maybe for Chiara my, my question would be more like because uh, uh, what was the call to exactly? Hold on, I, I can't uh, see it, but it was transparency yeah. is the Western ideal or something. Yes, so transparency is not always good. There are these are European values that are not applicable to our context. Yeah, I I, I guess Chiara, it's like what aspects were shared that weren't good. You know, I think uh, what 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 did the did the person mean? And then for Yaksan, I think would you share the full budget with the community? So let's say you've got a hundred thousand dollars from a donor, fifty thousand dollars is covering organizational costs, and then fifty thousand are going to the community and you might be having conversations with the community about the 50,000 that they can have decisions but would you also share the 50,000 that is going into the the INGO and that's probably the conservative figure if we're being completely honest yeah you want um, to try and say this no. yes go for it yeah then I, I will also add a few thoughts afterwards yeah just quick I will answer only the part it's concerning the community. I will not uh, like answer or share the part where our salary is or the NGO uh, admin. Goes. But why not? Because that also gives them insight, right? Because we're saying to the donor, oh, we need our technical expertise. We've got all of these things. But actually, the community might be saying, well, we can do that, that, that for a lot cheaper than you. So give us 75,000 and you guys keep 25,000. So if you don't give all of the information, then how can you have a transparent uh, discussion about the balance of power between money that is for those communities and those that have been siphoned off, dare I say, by humanitarian actors and as intermediaries? I can reply, but I, I don't want to take all the time. I will message on the chat. <laughs> yeah, send it in the chat so we also can continue there. Um, and Kiara, if you want to answer Craig's other question and then Lana over to you. Yes, and uh, thank you both of you for these very good insights. Craig, you asked about uh, to know more about the context uh, where this quote uh, is taken from. So yeah, um, as I mentioned, uh, the consultation loop was long, six months in total. Uh, during these six months, food insecurity data uh, for the country changed. It meant that two of the communities we spoke with became less food insecure. It meant that uh, they dropped out of our pro. They 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 will drop out of our program. So then this presented a dilemma: should we tell them or not? And so when discussing when discussing, should we go and tell them? Should we not? 
the the views the uh, yeah the the staff was split in uh, in the right course of action basically over yeah i think we Thank we you. talked about this before kiara and i was asking the same questions um but um yeah i think we have to keep in mind also the the risk that we're putting on the national staff that are living in the communities is what you were saying before um like the the you know the, the security risks um, of being the delivering the bad news basically and then having to stay in the community um just want yes, to I, add what you yeah absolutely this is a very real concern uh, again confidentially one of the staff members told me look these people know where i live so it's obviously a very real risk Nana, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanted to. I don't know if it, this is this is a thought or a question, but maybe a bit of both. But I agree what uh, with what Greg said about the communication. I think the key element to be better in transparency is how we communicate, but not exactly what we communicate. Of course, I'm not saying that we should hide, but it's like communicating with a kid. You don't say everything to a kid uh, in, in certain ages, but you, you address or you adjust your communication to a kid to explain and then to be to make her more part of the of the house activities or the school activities, whatever is the whatever is the kid uh, communicating with or inserted in. So my question, I think, to Kira, it's um because I, I also, and then just adding a, a, a different other point, is um, I don't think hiring a team from the community, it's uh, it's a matter of localization and it's also not a matter of um, communication. Having having people to translate to us is not a, a matter of like being good in um, communicating well. So my question to Chiara is how, what was the good outcomes or good experience if you could share with us because I, I I saw a lot of like good points from your presentation and your sharing um that address communication a better communication to the communities then then uh, that leads to a good uh, community participation thank you Lana um yeah this is a very good question um so if I got your question right, I think one of our lessons learned is um, um, the fact that sustained engagement is uh, helpful in a number of ways to foster agency, foster transparency, um, mitigate risk, mitigate expectations. So some of the participants, when we went back to them on the second on the second visit, they told us, do not let so much time go without without giving us updates. Um, we want this communication to be more frequent, if you like. Um, um, I think I don't in terms of um, what. I guess I mentioned the fact that uh, we used a number of measures to mitigate, uh, to manage those expectations. The team reiterated multiple times over the phone, in person during the discussions that funding was not confirmed. And so participants should manage their expectations. However, the reality is that these mitigation measures are only effective to a certain point. Um, these are vulnerable communities. Um, the power imbalance there is inevitable yeah, to raise expectations, basically. Um, I think um, we told them on the uh, after the second visit, uh, actually on the second visit, we told them um if you are if if funding is confirmed we will get back to you if funding is not confirmed we you will not hear from us um i don't have insights 
as to whether this is the right approach, meaning uh, whether people should be just left uh, uh, waiting or yeah, whether they should be left. I guess I don't know whether that is sufficient to yeah um, manage their expectations, basically. But, uh, yeah, so I hope this answers your question, Lana. Yeah, just it's just like to understand if you if the organization had any different in different tools in communication with the community. But yes, it, it did, and it's clear uh, that also uh, like you you manage you 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 feel a little bit more like uh, the, the the expectations of the community. And I I agree with you. Thank you very much. Um. Jackson, is this a, a new hand? Oh, well, uh, it's enough. I always have something to say when it comes to community engagement. Great, so, go for it. I mean, just going back, I mean, what level of information do you think you need to share? Because that's what really probably we need to discuss. Sharing the whole budget, definitely not. <laughs> I mean, will uh, will put everybody at risk. Even the reputation of the organization would be at risk of you sharing the whole budget. Probably sharing part of the budget where it concerns the community directly, that would be a good idea. Of course, expectation of the community. I think more, in most cases, the community, yes, they have high expectation, but they know where the fund is going low. They watch the news. Many of them, they communicate with everybody to know what's next. So basically, when I worked in some camps, they probably know how much funding for the project before I even know the approval of the proposal, because they are in survival mood and they try their best to get, gather information. So probably if we go back and share certain information, that would be important because failing to share the information with the community, that's putting us as coming or jumping with parachute as a committee and uh, thinking us as an NGO committee, we know much better than the locals. And that's uh, never true. And that's me, we're not taking the locals as a partner. Thank you. Thank you, Yaxan. Um, yeah, these are very, very good thoughts, and uh, yeah, I agree with you. It, uh, the, the extent of information we want to share is um, uh, there is no sort of guidance on it. Um, when when we conducted this exercise, there was no existing tool that we could use. We drafted our own tools in terms of monitoring the risks, monitoring um, expectations for assistance. We drafted the tools on uh, sort of um, how to do this and how to do these consultations, how to engage communities on multipurpose cash programs. What quite what elements of the, the of the program are they interested to inform? Um, we ended up choosing financial service providers, selection, targeting criteria, outreach and registration channels. We decided not to consult them on transfer value, for example, and this is because um, a number of reasons. One is um, because uh, we want to align with national social safety nets in order to not create tensions between uh, recipients of government and INGO assistance. Um, another reason for not consulting on transfer value is um, um the fact that um, um the transfer value is often determined on very technical grounds meaning the survival minimum expenditure basket is all is often used and this is a very technical concept and so it's difficult to explain to people how this map is calibrated so you don't want to go into those details and so Again, another quote from a staff member comes to my mind. If you consult people and they tell you, look, we think the right value to transfer is $150 per month per family, and then you end up transferring $100 only, they will accuse you of embezzlement. Um, so, 
So yeah, it's un there is no guidance on the right amount of information to share with communities. We charted our own way through this and documented our lessons learned. Over. Thanks, Chiara. We have a few more questions, um, if that's okay for you. Um, um, it's just it's great to see all this interest. So, Emmy, you have a question, and then Noor after that. Thanks, Kristen. Um, thanks, Chiara, for uh, this very interesting uh, presentation, and also, like uh, Kristen said, very honest thoughts. Um, so I have a, I have a couple of thoughts and also a question linked to that. Um, I believe that I mean that, that is something that we often discuss in this um, community chats as well, coffee chats. That uh, and I, I appreciate that you mentioned in your presentation that participation is not that complex, but it's not that easy as well. Like it's uh, there's a fine balance um, when it comes to. Uh, participation because it's not as easy as just going to a random group of people in the community and just asking uh, guys let's do a project together but also it's not that complicated that uh, oftentimes humanitarians uh, might think so um, what I believe and also it's our lessons learned from CCC and Mozambique for sure is that participation needs some preparation uh, which is often um, building uh, like or like helping for a community to build some collective action or shared understanding, common goals and um, and overall um, a space for dialogue. But also from our side uh, to help them to make, uh, which is totally fine, educated, educated, uh, like to come up with educated guests, which I'm not talking about education in a conventional way, but it's education about that topic. Or like uh, even uh, even basically just coming up with uh, plans altogether. So what we have seen in our definitely projects is that when we do preparation before participation, I mean, we do also participation before preparation in the sense that what kind of topics that you are interested in. But when we come up with trainings or workshops before participation takes place, we definitely see a difference in how the communities um, engage with, within themselves and with us too. Uh, and it, it totally changes the outcome. So from that perspective, I mean, there are different methodologies that are quite developing recently that um, we have been discussing for CLPs, but also community based planning, that there are many tools that can help communities to participate in their own ways. And uh, these tools basically navigate, I guess, uh, some of the challenges that that you also mentioned uh, that all of us face throughout the process. So I'm um, sorry that I missed the first minutes of the presentation if you if you mentioned, but did you have tools um, or like did you I mean, you mentioned about the information sharing that you didn't really have the guidance beforehand, but for the participation itself, did you have tools that you used um, before uh, in the preparation stage or um, yeah, this is what I'm wondering. Thank you. Thank you for for this very good question. Um, so, um, when it comes to engagement with communities on the design of multipurpose cash program, um, we didn't, we haven't come across existing guidance or tools to use. Um, uh, this is particularly for both facilitation tools in terms of um, yeah how to engage the people like is an, F an FGD appropriate or is it a quantitative survey more appropriate. Um, it's also regarding the um, indicators to measure to to me in indicators that measure the level of participation and uh, the level of risks as a way to measure the effectiveness of your activities. Are we really fostering a sense of participation here or not? So we we didn't come across any tools. Um, uh, I would love to hear from any of you if if tools exist and we miss them. Um, but I think one of the underlying messages that we want to give with our experience is that this guidance um, doesn't seem to be, this is a gap 
that uh, perhaps we can feel. Thanks, Kiara. Um, and uh, I suppose um, the follow up question to this is, will you be able to share Mercy Course tools? If I will be able to share uh, what, sorry, Christine? The tools that you developed for the tools. Um, this um, um, I think so. I mean, uh, I think so. I I need to check internally. I think it just needs to get um, internal approval. I don't see any reason why not. Mm -hmm. um, I would also be happy, like I mentioned to you, Christine, we are uh, um, drafting a learning brief to document these lear lessons learned. So I, I really hope to get that to you very soon. Great, thanks. Looking forward to that. Um, Noor, you have a question. Hello. Uh, it's not really a question. Actually, I um, I wanted to thank Chiara for her honesty. It's quite a uh, yeah an interesting conversation. And uh, coming from Lebanon, I know very well uh, what she's talking about. Like uh, things have been out of control lately, and um, it's quite hard to um, like communicate with communities uh, communities these days. Um, however, like I don't want to repeat what Emmy uh, already said, but there are like many uh, levels of participation um, where uh, let's say it starts with um, with the information sharing and then it goes until um, let's say the community is able to um, like lead the whole uh, response by themselves. Um, and it really depends like if an event happened, then you might, you know, like, uh, drop a few a few stairs in this uh, participation uh, um, uh, stairs. Uh, so, like this is totally, really totally understandable. But also on the community engagement uh, part, like um, uh, Kristen and many other colleagues have been working on uh, defining what communicate community engagement is lately, and uh, it's a mix of so many things. So I'm pretty sure that you've been doing community engagement in a way or another. Um, and transparency is one part of it. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen. Um, Try it. Like I was trying to look for. Um, sorry, can you see? Yeah, we can see. Uh, I was trying stairs. to look for the the stairs. It's not mm. ours, but uh, like I found it on Google like very mm. quickly. So it starts with information, feedback, and then mm. peer interaction, decision making. But like we cannot start from decision making at the beginning, especially if you're working with the uh, with the beneficiaries for the for the first time. And uh, like we helped build this, like until let's say the community uh, engagement and the placement response is actually uh, it aims at the accountability to affected population, which is something that you know we aim to do in the future. Like we're um, quite realistic, you know, on the on the result and what what happens and the obstacles that uh, that come. Uh, but. Um, as Emmy also was saying, like uh, the representation part, like if if um, like you're not able to communicate, let's say with beneficiaries, maybe you can see like uh, with community community leaders, uh, try to build like smaller groups at the beginning to uh, control the um, the tensions that happen here and there, and also um, also the fact that um, they need to know like. Uh, again, like your history and what you do, uh, and this would definitely, you know, uh, help you navigate uh, through the community as well. And I would like to add one thing here. Like I remember I was um, like a camp manager in, in Lebanon and we started working with uh, uh, camps uh, that were really like threatening, uh, threatening us whenever we are entering uh, their village. Uh, with knives sometimes, you know, and then the, the same communities, once they sat with us and trusted us and worked with us throughout two years, they were actually able to um, like work on their own community, community led uh, projects by the supplies and and sometimes like finance the supplies themselves Like they collected money from the camps and uh, built their own, let's say, water tanks, uh, rehabilitated the camps, um, etc. 
Uh, it all takes time. Uh, what matters really is to start, you know, and start building or working with the, I don't want to say the same beneficiaries, but the same area, you know, where you have um, a, a good reputation and a good knowledge, you know, on, on what you do. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, keep building and keep the this like institutional, uh, let's say, memory that like travels from a project to another. You don't have to like every time you want to create a project, like start from from scratch and uh, like working with um, with uh, Kristen and other colleagues that there are so many, so many tools uh, that are already available, especially on the community coordination toolbox. Uh, and there's a um, like search button that you could use. I, I will share the link with you. It literally has everything. I know it might be like overwhelming. So if you if you have like any specific request, you know, just to start small, let's say, and not to overwhelm you with all these tools, uh, reach out to us and we'll be we'll be happy to support actually. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you, Noor. Yeah, put the link in there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, Xan, you have a question and then Craig as well. Yes, I have a question, and uh, of course, thank you for the work. <laughs> I was just asking you many, many questions, but I'm sure you did great work, and it's not easy. We know the, how the community is, and we know Russia. You're providing a, a financial support, like or like a cash program. This is the hardest, and this is where my question is: within Mercy Corps or maybe other organizations, would you have the same difficulty if you have a protection program? Or probably because I know when it comes to like actual items, people will be more aggressive. Why probably when it comes to protection or uh, medical services, things will be different than community engagement. Thank you. Um, so if I understood well, your question is uh, whether our experience uh, would be different if uh, the program was an in-kind program. Yes, yeah, that's and very, if you compared it with other programs. Mm, yeah, absolutely. This is a very, very good question. Uh, I don't have any priors on that. I I, I guess uh, this was, I'm a cash advisor. I'm um, sort of less experienced with the in-kind or service uh, modalities of assistance. Um, um, I do agree with you. I can relate to what you say. I think cash assistance is very sensitive. It, um, uh, it can, it, it's often it often fuels social tensions in Lebanon. Again, uh, social tensions between the refugee and the host community are often flared by news about cash assistance. Uh, nothing else. Uh, I guess I don't have any other insights here, really. Sorry about that. He's muted, but he's saying no problem from my lip reading skills. Um, uh, Craig, do you want to go ahead if you have a question or comment? Yeah, I think it's 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 yeah, it's, it's part of a reflection, really. I think about the different entry points into the community engagement bit, and you can't just start from decision making straight straight away. It kind of, I think it's it's also difficult to look at this in in without looking at it alongside the partnerships and local actors piece um because i think when when the process is a bit like okay we've applied for funding we've got funding especially let's say in emergency context where there's been less space for consultation in the design process so sorry okay we've got project we've got funding now we need to find a way to communicate with the, the affected communities. Then it does become more difficult, but in most contexts, the communities are already responding, right? So even in that cash intervention in the camps, I think there was a mention there of how relationships um, changed once you started engaging, but they were probably already mobilizing cash from within the community and sharing it with others or to try and solve community solutions without any external intervention. So I think 
often we kind of come from the perspective of this is what we offer how do we communicate it to the communities so they don't resist what we're trying to offer them um and i think if i think we have to look at it also from the partnership perspective and are we investing enough time as a sector to really understand what those com existing community structures are are they youth volunteer structures which is what we see a lot of the time for example who are then not eligible to access access funding um but they are most likely using their savings mobilizing money from family and friends finding donations distributing already so are we really thinking about how the resources we have available can be used to strengthen those types of structures that doesn't mean you don't also engage with the local leaders and see how to align it to local authority budgets local authority plans and so forth as uh, how you partner with them but um but yes and obviously i agree with everything that's been said on the kind of community approach and the information sharing and all of that side of it but i just also want to keep a focus on are we doing enough to understand what the community is already doing and what's our added value in a short-term intervention which it normally is because even if we look at communicating with the communities from the budget we have in six months time after the cash is distributed we might not be there any longer anyway and <laughs> so um you know we might have done our report but have we strengthened the local structures and their own decision making and their own information sharing and their own transparency mechanisms that that might be different from how we communicate um again maybe just one last point on that youth Volunteer youth structures have a very different way of working, a very different way of sharing information and making collaborative decisions and, and leveraging different capacities than how an INGO may communicate through emails and planning forms and strategy documents and all of this sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, just, just a few uh, reflections, really. Um, and thanks also uh, to Kiara for the openness and transparency of your own uh, learning appreciated alongside the others is there anything you want to answer or add to that Kiara uh no I'm uh, this, these were very very good thoughts I'm I yeah I I don't have anything uh, anything else to add really um I don't think Craig had any specific questions, um, so I would be keen to hear others. I think there is another hand up. Yep, Aminu um, has a question or a comment, so please go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, it's uh, Thank you, Kristin, for the opportunity. Um, it was a good uh, presentation, um, and I'm happy uh, that it, uh, the, the engagement sustain was helpful and then um, my question here is uh, mine is just a question so uh, looking at this multi-purpose a focus on the given a, a focus on this multi-purpose cash assistance for the people in need in, in Lebanon um, uh, how I just want to ask a simple question how we, I don't know if I missed this part maybe uh, you explain it was explained clearly during the presentation how was uh, how were the the, the Lebanese communities um, sorry the perspectives of women and at risk groups uh, prioritize or address in the consultation process thank you Nova yes thank you Amino for the question um, my connection is not great. I think your question is how did we address uh, the needs of different um, vulnerable categories in the consultations. On this front, we conducted 16 focus group discussions disaggregated by gender and age. So uh, four FGDs with young male, four with the old males, four with young women, four with the old women. That was uh, the level of disaggregation that we did um, for this exercise. We didn't have resources to go beyond that. Um, yeah, I hope this answers the question. And um, I know we have uh, very little time left. Um, so if there are no more questions, perhaps I can just share one last uh, the, the, uh, concluding thought from my end. 
we are reflecting on what recommendations we want to make based on our experience. I think Craig uh, made a very good point about, as well as Noor, you both made a very good point about the need to think about the entry points. Um, we have reflected on this and uh, we think, I think based on our experience, I don't think we would like to do this exercise again in a in a context where funding is not confirmed. And so what this means is that um, we would rather use our experience to advocate with donors for flexible funding uh, so that we don't need to set every everything down in writing, to put everything down in writing in the proposal. But we want to be able to maintain a level of flexibility to be able to adapt the program, to design the program once funding is confirmed. So um, I think uh, th this, this will be our strongest recommendation. Frank, right. do you have a, a question or last thought? Yeah, so uh, just to jump in on that point as well, I think, yeah, it's always that difficult dilemma uh, on raising expectations and having resources. and. and where we've tried to do that from the youth perspective, for example, often young people are asked to advocate, join spaces to share their input and to be on panels and all of this sort of, sort of stuff. But most of the time, there's no collaboration to actually fund the things they're calling for. Um, and I think this is quite similar. So, But we do know that $500 can have a massive impact. So I think it's trying, if possible, it's kind of starting those lighter touch, less intensive conversations, but at least engaging the people and then bringing some even small resources, even if it's up to five, like $500 or something like that. At least that allows to establish ways of working. And then it gives you also a bit of an evidence base to then show to the donor and say, okay, well, we funded five hundred dollars, but actually the wider needs is probably more ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars. And if we can then in, invest in more of a consultative and you know a joint proposal, then we can reach that. So yeah, I think it doesn't have to be so black and white. And I think uh, any flexible money in the organisation can be really well used in that type of relationship building activities that go that enable consultation and learning, but also help. Uh, build trust through tackling one smaller issue at the start, let's say. Thanks, Craig. Um, Kara, I'm wondering, so I know we're, we have to end this soon, but you were mentioning it was, it, as we know, participation, it takes time and it's quite resource heavy. Um, uh, of course, it's, um, uh, it's very impactful as well, but uh, you were saying it took 15 days of, you know, a, a big team, etc. Uh, where did you get the funding for this? Was this internal funding or was did do you have are there donors that you want to um, give a shout out to, to who provide you funding for actual community consultation before project design? Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Christine. So um, uh, multipurpose cash programs tend to be very hectic at the beginning um, when you set up, when you set systems up. And then um, uh, once the systems are up, sort of you have this monthly cycle of distributing assistance. And at those times, uh, field teams can have uh, cap spare capacity to conduct assessments in like consultations to inform the next proposal. So yeah, we use the, 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 the resources we had at the end of the old of the previous multipurpose cash program to do this. Okay, no, fantastic. I think it's great that you actually quantified how much time it takes as well. And we can um, help share this information with donors that we need flexible funding um, and we need, um, and we need dedicated funding for, um, participation before before the design process is happening. Yeah. Um, any last thoughts from anyone before um, before wrapping up? If not, um, we're really looking forward to the, um, the learning report. Um, is that what you called it, Kara? Um, yes. 
we we look forward to sharing the learning brief with you. I will also double check whether the tools can be shared. Fantastic. Um, thanks so much to you, Kiara, and to everyone who's been active in this discussion. Um, super interesting discussion, and it's not going to end here. We'll continue to to try and, and be an open and transparent space for these kind of uh, learnings and sharing with each other. So thanks, everyone, and um, we'll see you again next month. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank and you. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Amina, do you have Cheers. a... Amino, did you raise your hand? Maybe it's a goodbye hand. Hello? Yeah, yeah, Christian, I, I have a, a brief recommendation to make, but uh, my network is bad, it's crappy, so I'll, I'll drop some, some lines maybe for email. Perfect. Thanks, Million. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.